Welcome back for people who are joining us or wake up for people who are still here. Um, continuing the theme, apne already palda refer kari chuka chai pan. Morana Alina Kalamasi Barakat Lane. Talabtu Riyasat for Wajatahu fi Talabal Ilm wa Taqwa. I sought leadership and I found it in cultivating knowledge and piety. Kind of staying to that theme, we can discuss about leadership being women. And I, I am very proud of all our men colleagues and brothers that have joined us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we like to talk and honestly the next 30 minutes is us talking together and discussing um, this topic more. This very little didactic, I highly encourage each of you to think about your own journeys and bring your own questions and challenges to the discussion. Um, I'm briefly going to introduce our panelists and set a little bit of background of, of what our talk is and then the floor is open to, to everyone. Um, we have three very distinct panelists. Um, Alethia Ben Malbari is an associate professor of pediatrics and medical education at the University of Texas uh, at Austin, Dell Medical School, and is an outpatient general pediatrician for the general, uh, the chief, med sorry, is the pediatrician for Dell Children's Medical Group in Austin, and uh, currently is the chief Divi of Division of Ambulatory Pediatrics. Dr. Munira Bain Dudbai is uh, my go-to OBGYN referral for everything and is a private practice owner for the last 16 years. She's been an OBGYN. Um, Dr. Munira Bain Basrai is representing the research branch of um, leadership and she is a senior scientist in the genetics branch of the National Cancer Institute. So a really warm welcome and thank you for your time, panelists. Um, and I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to set the stage. So the background is that in the preclinical years, there's not much disparity in terms of women and men entering the medical system, finishing medical school. But there's this phenomenon of the leaky pipeline that as we grow in our profession, the leadership positions kind of fall out for women. And I want to pose this question of why you think that may be. And I'll entertain answers. In what way? Good. So, bi biology, um, biology, and um, traditionally, the apna uparvaji bhoyche in terms of women and mumanat of holding our roles and responsibilities. Mainly, the bab of tarbiyat is is for us. So, evidence shows that men have m much many women have five times more career breaks and disruptions in their pathway because of uh, the responsibilities and priorities that they make towards family. Um, I just in included this because I thought we're at a conference and it seems appropriate. In 2012, Brigham Young's study found that men dominate the speaking time in conference meetings, talking 75% of the time, while women speak only 25% of the time. I've tried to balance that out for us here. Um, another study found that men and women interrupt women more often during conversations. These are just a few thoughts. These are a few examples of things that happen around us which we don't really internalize or think about, but affect how we are perceived. And there's another Harvard Business School case study that shows that when men are liked, they rise to leadership positions more. But when women are likable, their capacity to lead is almost undermined. 
So there are these notions and perceptions where we are not seen as capable or confident or efficacious. Um, why these perceptions exist and how we can overcome them is kind of something I want us to think about. There's a lot of research going on within these fields in terms of gender disparities, but I, I don't want to go into that much because being Muminat, we have specific roles, and I feel like fighting against that is not the goal. But accepting it, owning it, what our roles and responsibilities and priorities are, and within that, how we can make our selves grow and reach whatever pathway that you have as your goal, how is that how we how can we make that possible? There was a study done by Zenger Folkman, um, and they kind of outlined these sixteen characteristics as leadership qualities, and men and women were equal. But again, there's disparities in terms of the outcomes of what these qualities entail. This is the last slide. So I, I want to open this up and start talking about this, is think about what personal or professional barriers you feel might be impacting yourself, women, or your sisters, or moms, or daughters, from reaching the highest levels of leadership in the medical field. I forgot the field. Um, while you're kind of marinating, I am going to briefly ask our panelists to touch on their journey of how they started and how they have achieved their goals. What sacrifices did you have to make? What compromises did you have to make? And hopefully we can share in this discussion. Okay. Um, thanks for the opportunity to have me speak. I have no idea what your criteria were to, to choose me, but I'm very humbled to be here. Um, so there are many, many, many familiar faces. Many of you have sort of followed my journey with me, so it's really exciting to share. Um, I'll start with the basics. I did all of my everything in New York. So I was born in New York, I grew up in New York, I went to college in New York, I did medical school in New York, and I did my residency training there. So I am an outpatient general pediatrician. I trained at Mount Sinai in New York City on the Upper East Side. Um, I stayed on for a year as chief resident afterwards and then was really lucky to be offered a position in their faculty practice. And in my chief residency year, that was sort of the first time that I had to make a decision. I knew I was going to be an outpatient general pediatrician, but I had to decide, is it academic medicine that I'm choosing or is it private practice? And at that time in my life, I decided, I think it's going to be academic because if I choose academic now, at least I get to stay in this setting. And my mentors would tell me, if you choose private and you want to come back to academics, it's going to be very difficult. And what I had discovered throughout my residency, and especially in my chief year, is that I really, really enjoyed teaching. And that was a part of my career that I wanted to keep up. And so that was sort of a branch point that happened at that time. I failed to mention, and I should have started from the beginning, that I wanted to interweave sort of what was happening personally with me at the same time. So I, those of you who have known me for a really long time know that I um, have been engaged. I was engaged to my husband for quite a long time, and then we, we got married in my second year of medical school. And that was something that we, I knew that I did not want to put off because life was going to happen. I had already chosen a really long path, and I didn't want to wait to sort of start what was happening in my personal life. And so I got married in my second year of medical school, and then um, my husband, Murtaza, came to New York, and um, I did residency in, in New York City. And in my third year of residency, I had my first son. So Tejum is now 10 years old, and so he was born when I was a third year resident, and what a journey that was, right? Having a, having a kid in residency, um, but I did it, again, because I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to wait, um, and life had to, to go on. So I had my decision point, I chose academic pediatrics, and then I was in this role. I was a, you know, a junior faculty member at Mount Sinai, which is a really renowned institution, very lucky to be there practicing outpatient gen peds. Um, but I, um, always liked the admin side of medicine as well, and I was really good at it. I, was, I knew I was organized, I knew I could do it well, 
And I started doing a lot of things for our little practice at the time and realizing that I wasn't getting the recognition for it. And so I asked for the recognition. I went to my chair and I said, I'm doing all this work. I want to be named medical director. And she said, yes. I didn't, I, all I had to do was ask. But if I had not asked, I would have been doing all of that work and getting no recognition. And at the same time, I was continuing to teach in the medical school. I was serving as a mentor for, for students. And I had my second son, Mukarram was born, and we were living a pretty busy, difficult life in New York City. And many of you here, as I was going through that process, would say, why are you guys still in New York City? It's so expensive. We lived in New York We lived in Manhattan. It's so expensive. Why are you doing this? Um, and the reason that I did it is if I had moved to the suburbs, it means that I would have had at least an hour commute, and I had young kids. And I wanted to get out of work and five minutes be at the daycare, or five minutes be home, or five minutes be a walk to school so I could be with my kids. So that was a huge sacrifice, that we have a huge financial sacrifice that we had to make. Um, but we did it. But we did it knowing that there was a plan. My choices, our choices as a couple, were very deliberate. Murtaza is not in medicine, but I am really lucky. And those of you who know him, don't tell him that I'm saying good things about him. <laughs> really lucky that he was a huge support and he saw my vision and stuck with my vision. Um, so finally, my third pregnancy, my daughter Maria was born. I was on maternity leave and I get a text from a colleague to say, hey, are, are you around? We're, you know, we're, I, I wanted to know if you're able to um, interview someone. They're applying for the course director position for one of the biggest courses in the medical school. And I said, no, I'm not around, I'm on maternity leave, but I want that course director position. So I applied for the course director position on maternity leave, interviewed for it, and got it. So I came back from my third maternity leave, now in a new course director position of the Art and Science of Medicine course, which is the preclinical course in the medical school for the first and second year medical students, and in this medical director role that I had fulfilled. And I told my husband, Murtis at that time, I said, Give me two years and we will leave New York City. But I need to build this. This was a CV builder. Because when I move, I don't want to move laterally. I want to move into a higher position. I want to, I want to move up. I want to move into a leadership role. And again, he trusted me. I don't, I don't know why, but he trusted me. And um, I found myself now in a really, really great opportunity. So. About two years in, I had made some, I had done some courses and gone to meetings like this where I networked with a lot of people and I had some contacts um, in Austin. So the University of Texas at Austin, some of you have gone there. They have a new medical school. It's fairly new. It's only seven years old. And I, and there were really long standing big institutions in other places. Um, but I wanted to choose a place that was innovative, that I could really be at the ground. Um, and I contacted um, my contacts there and I was chosen to be their new chief of ambulatory pediatrics, which is extremely exciting. It's a completely new division. Um, so I get to really marry my love for teaching. So I still do that very much in the medical school, but also lead an entire division of faculty. And I built a new clinic for them, which is really exciting. So that was not brief, but I'm gonna pass it on. <laughs> I'll start with my journey. I was born and brought up in Kuwait. I finished my schooling, then I went to India. I did my medical school, my residency in India. And that's when we got, my, uh, when we got married. My husband came to New York. He did his residency and I did my residency in OBGYN in India. And I wanted to complete residency and then come because so many people had told me, you will do internal medicine. So I didn't want to leave anything halfway. I completed my residency. Then I came and I, Maulani Dwasi, I did get residency uh, in OBGYN. So I was six, I spent six years in New York. Then I got a job uh, as a, in a private practice in Las Vegas. And I was there for eight years. And from there, I moved to my final destination, which is Dallas and I've been there for nine years, and I have started my own private practice. And 
It has just been a journey stepping up. Yes, it has been tough, but only a tough journey is going to be memorable. It, it has it had so many roadblocks, but and I'm a, I will say that without the help of my parents, my in-laws, and my husband, who's a neonatologist, it would have been extremely difficult. I, I was even the director of, um, I was a chief medical director at Louisville Hospital, where I am currently working, and I have served my term. Right now, I'm solely into private practice, and um, I'm by myself. I have a nurse practitioner, and it's been a very busy and, alhamdulillah, very successful practice. So I grew up and I was raised in Pune. I did my bachelor's and master's in Pune University. And right when I finished my master's, I was very ambitious to go and do my PhD. Um, my dad had a massive heart attack and walked into his grave at the age of 50. Um, my mom was very young. I had an elder brother and a younger brother. Um, we were really shocked and shattered, and because it was always my father's desire that I do my PhD. But they were very conservative, and they didn't want me to do a PhD unless I got married. So I had a lot of opportunities in India to do PhD, but uh, my papa always wanted me to be married before I did my PhD. And you know, this was in 1981, and I was like, Papa, which boy is going to accept? me having this career. Well, he went away, and uh, then I met my husband in Mullah Zarwa, thank, thank God. And the first date we had, um, he looked at me and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I really want to do my PhD, and I want to do it in America. He said, wow, great, even I want to go to America. You know? <laughs> and so I, I, there was nothing else to be said. Like, I think it was love at first sight. <laughs> um, we, I remember the garden and the bench we sat where we had this conversation. And uh, I came home and mama said, okay, how was the ball? It's like, Mani to ina sate shadi <laughs> Like nothing, like all this ITNC business that I do and how much dating just didn't happen. PhD was my goal, right? <laughs> so then um, we got married at Mola Sand. We came here in 84. Um, I entered the University of Tennessee in Knoxville to do my PhD. Adnan pursued his engineering degree. Um, I, it was tough, I didn't see my mom who I was very attached to. So I finished my PhD and then we kept doing Aras for Mullah repeatedly about where we should move and Mullah kept saying postdoc Karone. Like, you know, like every time he went to Mullah, he kept saying, nah, tame, tame taj ho, tame ka, uh, taj ghar lo, taj vaso. Anyway, long story short, I ended up at Johns Hopkins Medical School. I worked with a very famous geneticist who works on chromosomal instability and um, and Mola gave Raza because we were in Knoxville, it was a very small town, there were no Mumineen. So we moved to Baltimore in 93. I had a very, very good, spectacular postdoc experience. Um, there were challenges, you know, I was a Muslim, I was a minority, I was a woman of color. I was at Hopkins, the world's premier institute, but it didn't matter. Um, then, uh, unfortunately, as I was finishing up my postdoc, my, my advisor decided to go to Canada. and. You know, I know you will laugh, but I always wanted to be a scientist from the day my mom conceived me, right? So I went and told him. I was like, I'm going to have an independent position. He's like, but I'm leaving for Canada. I said, it's okay. And somehow, because I had set my goal high, he, he decided to support me from Canada. So I was an orphan. I had no PI, no lab, nothing. I, I stuck around for two years. I was the biggest thorn in the, in, in the neck of everybody's lap, but I wasn't going to give up. So I finished my postdoc. Uh, I had several offers for faculty positions, uh, but Adnan had moved with me, uh, unlike any man who would do. So he moved with me from India to North Dakota, North Dakota to Tennessee, Tennessee to Baltimore. And my poor husband had just settled down. I was like, Have a postdoc, Patigal, I'm getting a job in Houston, I'm getting a job at MD Anderson. I was like, Oh my God, this poor guy, what's he going to do now? But he had a very good job in Washington. So Mulani Duarte, I got an interview at the National Cancer Institute. We did Raza, we did Aras for Mulani, Mulani Dua Farmari. And from all the offers, this offer was the best. So I moved to NIH in 1998. Adnan could keep his job. He didn't have to pack again for his wife. And, <laughs> uh, um, and so I've been there for the last 24 years. Um, my only advice to women uh, is that 
I, I want you to look at your journey like you have a GPS, right? And I think you want to set your goal. So my goal was PhD, and I achieved it. My goal was to be an independent scientist. I achieved it. Why? My goal was to become a senior scientist, and I achieved it. So I did program my GPS, and I had lots of bumps and lots of detours, and I had to stop. But I think you can just imagine that you're going, let's say, from Washington to New York, and you program your GPS, and there will be traffic, there will be jumps, there will be bumps, there will be detours. She'll keep saying, go left, go right, you know. But you have to reach New York. You're going to get there, right? So you are going to overcome every obstacle and find solutions. So if you have to go through all the gali gujras and get to New York, you will, right? You're not going to just settle down, you know, on a highway or a road stop. So that's the only lesson I want to convey to you. That set your goal, set your GPS, and with Mullah's Dua and the right direction. And then the last thing I want to say is that women often don't reach out to find um, advocates, right? So you have to find an advocate. You have to very, at every stage of your career, you have to find somebody who believes in you, who respects you, who loves you, who admires you, who understands the passion for what you want to do. And, and you have to really use that GPS to guide your career, right? So at every stage in your career, you have to find that GPS. You have to find, you know, this scientist, that scientist. You will have many adversaries. I wear Rida to work. I work for a federal government. I'm surrounded by Yehudis, Jews, you know. And, and the first time I decided to wear Rida, uh, I, got, I got comments like, what the heck do you think you're doing? How would you feel if I wore a cowboy a hat and boots to work? And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I, I don't respect you for what you wear. I respect you for the brain you have. So if you cannot respect me for the intellect I bring to the NIH, then I don't think we can be colleagues. So it, it was a very bold step for me. And um, alhamdulillah, I really feel that my, my cultural diversity, my, my value to respect my cultural identity has got me to the path. And I really firmly say that. Because I have had lots of scientists come up to me and say, we respected you a lot. You know, I started with it, wearing Rida about 11 years back. But we respect you even more, more now because if this is the integrity and value and character you have for your culture, we can only imagine what you bring to the branch. So next time you write a paper, send it to us. We'll take it. Right? So two lessons. Get an advocate, set your GPS, and believe in yourself, and surround yourself with people who will support you move away from the negativity. Thank you. Um, the floor is open for questions for our panelists. So a major theme that seemed to strike um, with all three of such esteemed panelists was that there were certain points where you had to be bold and really courageous and, and um, advocate for yourself um, and uh, of course um, Dr. Bustai also mentioned finding advocates amongst the people around you of course you have your support systems which all three of you touched on um, but how did you manage to find advocates within your professional support systems um, to really you know gas you up and, and give you the courage to make those you know bold requests for yourself If you're talking about advocates just for us Muminat Behno, probably the younger generation will find advocates now. We didn't have advocates. We were the one who probably started. It was during her 11 years back, 13 years back, when we started wearing Rida. There were no advocates. It was just Molano Farman, Mathi Chadavanu, switch. It took me a long time to decide the day when I would go in a Rida. It was f eight years I worked in Vegas. Four years was no Rida. Four years was with Rida. One day I come dressed up different. It just took maybe like maybe a full sleepless night, what I'm going to do tomorrow. But I did it. It didn't do anything. People didn't care. And that was the main thing. Nobody cares as long as you bring in what they brought you in for. 
and your personality, it's there will be roadblocks. But I didn't get any roadblock. And maybe because whatever little roadblocks I got for me being a moment was something I didn't care about. They were very frivolous for me. We carried on. So maybe that is what today we want to hope that all of us who are in Rida are able to guide our younger generation that it's not going to be far when women in Rida will be in the mainstream. We have to bring it in. Amnata me jovo Indian programs ma. I'm sure people watch Indian programs like Indian Idol, Kapil Show. There are people sitting in Rida in the audience. There are people who come up to the stage. There has been a show I saw. A lady in Rida came up the stage and asked a question to Shah Rukh Khan. I know that. And then I don't know if you have seen there are movies when there will be sh shots when you'll see Rida Ma lady walking. It's just time. This is going to be normal routine. We got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. Your, the new generation has to just dive into this thought. It's Rida, and it'll take you where you have to go. So in terms of advocates, I, I, I think what you have to do is uh, success is like business, right? So if you are not going to position yourself to advocate yourself, you're not going to find an advocate, right? So when I go for a scientific meeting, I make sure I read the roster, I go to the internet, I research everybody's papers, and I figure out that I want his attention. So I read his last three papers, I figure out when he's at the coffee stand, because at the bar I don't go, right? And um, I just say, you know, Dr. James, that last paper you wrote was awesome. And you know, that, that clinical study you have, wow, I mean, it just really shattered me. I don't watch it, but don't watch it. But that's enough to start a conversation, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that if you want a job at Pizza Hut, you don't go and tell them how good of a burgers you play, right? You tell them you can make dough, right? So if the strategy for success is to figure out who you want to align with, who you want to win respect with, and to relate to them in their terms, right? So if somebody interviews in my lab, right? Um, I mean, I interview a lot of kids. I, I have like nine people in the lab. The first question I ask them is, what made you apply to my lab and not the guy next door? And if their lab is, if their answer is generic, you know, you do great work, blah, blah, blah. Okay, thank you very much, right? But if, if, the, if the reply is, I have read your research, you do this one, two, three, four, and this is the why I'm coming to you and not to Mr. James, I immediately recruit them, right? So advocacy is selling, right? So you can, you can imagine yourself to be in a car dealership where you're trying to sell BMWs and there's a Ford Escort sitting there, and the BMW is not shining, no light, the Ford Escort is nice and spiraling, they will buy that, right? So advocacy, success, and climbing up the ladder, you have to take the responsibility, right? A lot of us blame other people, we blame our situation. Maro boss kharap che, maro colleagues kharap che, maro trainees kharap che, maro neighbor kharap che, maro a kharap che. So I think you have to figure out a way to get out of that. And, and you know you only need two or three advocates, right? So at the NIH, I'm very fortunate. You know, the director's office is my next door. He's my best friend. We became friends 24 years back and he became the director, right? Mara Naseep, right? But I think that strategy is even here. I mean, if you have the roster, try to reach out to a few people and read them up. Don't just go blankly and say, you know, Tame Muniyabin, Ghana Acha, OPG, Maiche. Go look her up on the internet. Go look up her Facebook page. Pretend you've read everything about her, right? And that is the only way you're going to get advocates. Nobody is going to notice you unless you want, you, you want yourself to be noticed. And I'll just add to say that some of your mentors are going to fall into your lap. I know that you in particular, and there's other students here, you're starting residency programs, you're starting medical school. You know, within those programs, there's a structure for mentorship, and that's great. But you should also seek out mentors that are your ideal. What do you want to be eventually, right? So I had, there was one, there was a program that I was applying to in the Academic Pediatric Association called the Educational Scholars Program, and I had to identify a mentor at my institution and um, the person I wanted to ask was the dean of the medical school, because she's really well known in medical education. And people around me said, you can't ask her. She has very high expectations. At that time, I had a toddler and an infant. 
And she's not going to understand that if you can't meet this deadline and whatever. And I said to them, well, I have very high expectations of myself, so I'm going to ask her. And she said yes. And we had an amazing relationship over several years. And without my knowing, it, when I was transferring institutions, when I was looking into UT Dell, I did not tell a soul at Mount Sinai because you know, I didn't want to lay my cards out. But the only person I told was her. And without my knowing, she called the chair of the Department of Pediatrics on my behalf and gave a glowing review of my work. And the chair called me the next day and said, I don't know if you know, but your mentor just called me. And I can't imagine not hiring you. It was amazing. And so find people that are where you think are just like, how will they even talk to me? Ask them to be your mentor because that relationship can actually change the trajectory of your career. And it's incredibly meaningful. Um, the other thing that I'll just add in this arena, just based on what Dr. Munira was saying, is you truly have to advocate for yourself. And so, especially women, and as we know, in general, in all fields, but especially in medicine, the salary discrepancy is huge. I'm in an academic program, so I get paid by the University of Texas, but I did my homework before I went into this new position. Um, and I looked to see what the salary ranges were, and when it came time for me to negotiate, I did not ask for the 50th percentile. I asked for the first percentile at the highest, and the chair said, I'm going to make that happen. But you have to ask for it. You have to show your worth, and, show, and, and don't say, I hope that this can, I expect, based on the experience that I'm bringing in and what I will be able to do for this program, my expectation is that it will be there, right? So that's just one area that you might have to advocate yourself in terms of salary, but there's many other things. But as a woman, it's even more important to do it. Do your homework. probably heard this and I will just say it again, there is no right time. There is no right time to get married. There is no right time to have a kid. There is no right time. There's always going to be a hurdle ahead of you. So just do it. <laughs> just just if, if it's the time to get married and it's posed, get married. If Don't think too much about it because your life will sort of arrange itself around that. And yes, there are times that I had to prioritize my family much more than what was going on in my career. Perhaps this move could have happened for me five years ago, but it didn't, and that was important at that time. And still, I make all sorts of changes around my schedule. When I came into this position, I told the chair, I need to be able to work from home on Mondays and Fridays. I can't start clinic at 8.30. I need to get my kids to school. Like, I made it very, very clear. Um, about what my priorities were. So again, no right time, just kind of let life lead you on. And, and my advice is don't wait. I'm glad that there are now moment bhaiyo yaha. You cannot achieve the balance of personal and uh, professional me medical career without the help of your parents. It is extremely vital that parents understand that if the goals have to be reached, dikri yaha che, dikro yaha che, shadi residency ek jaga par thai. It it is such a big balance. There is compromise to be made, but you cannot do it without the help of parents. So hopefully, apna our generation na parents, and I would assume that today's parents who are now getting into the kids' marriage more more are all educated so they have to understand how much they have to support kim ke tumhara bachcha hota hai tumhe residency ma cho ya you've just started a new job you need somebody from your family to help you out with your kids 
and at the same time your husband have to make compromises too so this is a big give and take that's all i can say it's there is no right time there's no right way everybody has to adjust to their own situation so, so i remember when i was at hopkins and um you know when i was trying to look for faculty positions i there was an indian uh, faculty you know uh, at hopkins she was very good and i really admired her so i walked up to her office and i said rachni how the heck do you do all this and she said well it's really simple and I, i mean i think you are medical people so we study the cell cycle right so there are different stages right g1 s g2 m so she said you know as a woman you have to imagine yourself in a different stage of the cell cycle so right now you know you 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 want to have a faculty position you want to have a family you want to get married you are in a certain stage but that stage is not permanent you know in a few years you will move into another stage in a few years you will move into another stage so the women who get leadership positions i think it would be unrealistic to say you're going to get married you're going to have a kid you're going to finish your residency you're going to become going to become the chief that's not going to happen right so you really have to imagine your life to be in different stages and say you know the la last four years have been tough but the next four years are going to be different the next four years are going to be different so set some goal posts right so if i decide to go to new york from washington and i say mane tani daris ma jaau chu me be kalak ma pochis it's not realistic right mane 5 kalak lag se right and then i say well after 2 hours i'm going to take a halt right so i think it's unrealistic to set goals and i think we always keep saying this about women but i think men also have responsibilities a lot of men have responsibilities towards their parents towards their mom towards an ailing brother sister you know family members so i think yes we take a lot of credit for all what we do but i think the men have a lot of responsibility a lot of times the men have the responsibility you know of paying you know the house bills for for taking up lots of emergencies so i think just take life in strides mane ek jana ek okhare em kayu ke mara si ramzan ma kai bhi kai bhi nahi thatu to ke ke tame ek mahino khuda ni ibadat ma karo tame kai bhi research na karo it's okay 11 months you do it so there's no set goal sorry i guess good segue for me to jump in um um shukriya thank you very much um this was very enlightening for me um i'll be honest i was going to go to the surgical mishap session but i decided i would stay here and i'm glad i did um just one takeaway um and speaking beyond medical profession and women in medicine um i really wish my daughter was here she's a high schooler and you know she's a teenager but i think it would be um very good if on maybe jamaat level for ya bachi national level for level for we can do something like this for apna degree you know because i can help at home my wife can help we can give our input and our insight and our perspective <clears throat> but when they see it from other women in our community and culture i think it's very eye opening and i think very empowering it's not just the three of us we have all the other women in the audience who could very well sit here and do the same so it's very important aap je ki do teenagers waste the same talk should be heard by parents i agree and i just want to put a plug in for fatima bin ship chandler who during covid had actually organized a webinar panel a similar panel for uh, pre medical students or medical students and it was it was it's you know across the US and I actually have a recording that I'm happy to share um with the permission of the panelists of course um that you know uh we can maybe disseminate later or we can do multiple this is very important so I think I think you know as we have come I think setting role models and and uh, looking at other people have made this journey and shared their experiences is important but this is a sbma is a platform use it we have the infrastructure to make it a national jamaat 
or whichever level of thing. Uh, so just to answer the vice question, in Chicago Jamaat, there is a mentorship program. It's still coming up. They have made a committee and a subcommittee. And the plan is that it's not only medical, but uh, there are kids whose parents are in business and they don't know the school system. Uh, so the hope is that the ones who have gone through the system here can help the next generation. And I believe Dubai has a much advanced mentorship program and they have a yearly conference that they invite people from all over the world and from different fields to give talks. There's a hope that we can start something like that in Chicago and then disseminate it to other Jamaats as well. come to me, hi, um, I've had a couple parents come to me and say, uh, you know, my daughter wants to go into medicine. I'm really not excited about that. Uh, you three have kind of shown um, self-directed passion. How do you handle a situation like that? I don't know if you've been asked like where other parents say, hey, we have a daughter, she wants to go into medicine. Um, we don't think it's the best career choice for her. We're pushing her to go into whatever the case may be. Um, have, has that arisen how have you handled that? So that happened to me. I find myself in that yeah. position probably yeah. a handful of times now where, where people will come to me and say, hey, can you kind of talk her out of this? And I don't, but um, but it's you know these some of these antiquated sort of ideas um, where parents also are saying there's pressure from the parents, and then they're asking for people from the jamaat who are in medicine to kind of give pressure. Also, uh, I'm just wondering how you've been in those situations before and how you handle that. This was a situation a few years back. I thought that this is kind of changing that parents are really not influencing kids anymore. If they want to do medicine, they want to do medicine. But I think it's very important to ask the parents, what is their concern? Concern, suit hai, in our pe depend kare, ek kach concern nikal se, shadi ke vare kar se, bachcha ho ke vare tha se. That's where you give the example of the entire community. It's not a question of just a female wanting to be a doctor. It's even for the boy. The same thing. It's, it's a little, little hard in the US. No. You know, like an aptitude test, sometimes it just depends again on the age of the kid. And as they mature, they'll eventually show whether they're really going towards that direction or not. Ultimately, the question will come when you talk to the parent and the child. We just have to know what exactly are they thinking. It's, it's obviously not the right thing to tell them, yes, go for it, or give them the negatives of it, negatives and positives. But as they grow, they will mature. Our kids are so smart. They are much smarter than what we were at their age. They will eventually know. There is so much out there for them to choose. So this is one problem I think we all have as doctors. When we were in 
pl uh, going, planning to go into medical school, we we, no one had a backup plan. It was only medical school. Have we, people have a lot of backup plans. But that does not mean that I'm saying that, you know, it's okay, if they won't get into medical school, they go somewhere else. They probably will slowly mature and know what exactly they want to do. I think steering is telling, just talking to the child and finding out what is their thinking, what exactly is they want. It's not easy, it's it's stepwise approach. I don't know if I've answered that question. Sorry. Okay, I, th just one thing I want to add is that you do actually truly have to be passionate about it. And in your conversations with that child, if there is really not a seed of passion, then it may not actually be the right career for them because it's a long road. It's a long road, it's a difficult road. And so I think the first thing is to speak with the child and see, and if you see that spark of passion, then we have to be able to sort of, how do we add fire to that, right? How can we add fire to that? And it, depending on the age of the kid, maybe it's helping them find a way to volunteer. Maybe it's putting them in touch with one of the women physicians in the Jamaat and having them talk it through. And then you can get the parents on board because it is actually really important to get the parents on board, especially if it's a woman, because it is really important to have support when you're going through this. And they will feel very isolated if they're not supported by their family. So it's, a, as we said, a stepwise process, but really figuring out is the passion there, is it true? If it's there, then we have to feed the fire. And, and please forgive me if I misunderstood. But I think your question is that the parents are afraid of the daughter going into medical school and you don't know how to approach that. So I think the place to start would be to ask, start with the parents in trying to express to you what are their concerns if their daughter went to medical school, right? And, and go through that journey first. Maybe the parents need counseling, not the kid, right? And if parents need parents their concerns, hoy, Maybe you know they were not validated, they were misinformed, and and then let them make an intelligent decision is to give them all the information they need about their first, their fears, what they have, and then I think eventually they will decide, and and then ultimately it's the kid who's going to decide, right? So um, misinformation can like I, you know I as I said I wanted to be a scientist the day my mom conceived me, so there was nothing going to take me into medical school, right? So. When I finished my master's, I said to my mom, like, I'm not going to medical school school. I was a gold medalist of the Pune University. So I could have gotten into medical school. But I really didn't want to deal with patients. I could not see blood. I could not handle a needle. And, and I decided that I, I was very passionate about health. So I chose scientists as my career. And I think a lot of women nowadays in our community, I have personally uh, counseled four decrios recently and all four of them are pursuing their PhD. And my best favorite PhD is right here, that's named Kambati from my Jamaat, right? So she finished her PhD in psychology. She's an assistant professor at University of Maryland. And I'm really so proud of her. And I really want women to think of options um, of pursuing health-related research besides pursuing an MD because there are options. So I think it's in our X, X chromosomes that we could be here all day. But in the sake of time, I'm gonna have Lulu Abin take the last um, comment or question. So two things. One is to address your question. I think there's an elephant in the room that's not being spoken about with regards to that question that parents have. Is kid bikri, bikri rese, right? Will she be able to nibhau all the dikariyo chizo, like the responsibilities of a woman? in that type of household. In AMB, most likely the parents are worried about that. What will the marad be able to do? Now, although all of us, alhamdulillah, have marado who sacrificed with us, if not more, to be very frank. Like they've followed us just like how you were saying, they followed us around from place to place. And all of our marado have done that, alhamdulillah. Like we cannot be more grateful for that. So I think they definitely need a huge shout out because they are going completely against the grain 
in supporting us so firmly and strongly, probably against their own family members, half the time, <laughs> right? So more than likely, their parents are worried about her future as a wife, as a mother. Will she be able to take care? How logo kya kahenge kind of concept. I don't know if that's what it was. Is that what kind of came out of it? And, no, and, and I think these are valid questions because, to be very frank, we are the minority. Not all women do this. Not all women pursue this. And not all women have the backing and support of their spouses to and do it. Definitely takes a village, and on that note, I'm going to give a big shout out to my husband, Ibrahim in the back, um, because of which uh, I was able to help uh, bring you guys together. So thank you, everyone. Let's take a short break, and there's another breakup session, so we'll look into that. But Munira, uh, Dr. Munira Ben Bastrai, Dr. Munira Ben Dudbai, Dr. Alefe Ben Malbari, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We'll have their. Uh, contact information available um, and please reach out to any of them any of us to uh, further this discussion and uh, even build a mentorship program for the younger generation thank you, thank you. good luck to everybody out there thank you. Thank you.